both of our uh, teachings, but uh, I'm going to hand over to Professor Prasad to introduce today's speaker. But I just wanted to read the message which has been sent by Professor Noam Chomsky uh, to, to the Vice Chancellor directly. And it's very short. I'll just read this statement of his. Many, or rather, I should say, his question. Many of us remain very concerned about the crisis in JNU, which was apparently created and precipitated by the government and university administration with no credible evidence of any seditious activities on campus. Why did you allow the police on campus when it is clear that this was not legally required? Thank you, ma'am. Professor DJV Prasad, please introduce today's class. And today's speaker. Walagat, Thai Murray Nalandri, Ungalorakum in Vanakam. International Mother Language Day. And we are here. Namaste. Vanakam. Namaskaram. Good evening. Salam. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, uh, this is the place to talk about diversity. This is the place to talk about nationalism. And who better than Aisha Kidwai? I've known Aisha Kidwai for a very long time. I've known Aisha as a very young student. She was a young student, not me. Still <laughs> And Aisha was always, always, always this bright, this sharp, and with a great sense of humor. A great friend to friends. And boy, take her on and you know what hits you, or you won't know it. <laughs> so Aisha, uh, you know, has, has many, many aspects to her. The latest aspect, I shouldn't say the latest, one of the new aspects to her is as a translator. Uh, recent aspects and you know she's translated in Freedom Shade so she's got a book on therefore in partition and she actually puts herself in the midst in her family history a history that struggled for the nation a history where they chose chose India and chose to fight in spite of personal tragedies tragedies were, which were brought about by partition to, te to tell us to teach us and to call us anti-nationalists, to tell us that of what nationalism is, to teach us nationalism, is so idiotic. <laughs> it's pathetic. So I'm so glad that Aisha is here to speak today. And on, as I said, the International Mother, Mother Language Day, uh, it's interesting in, the, in the, the difference between tongue and language, which of course she'll work on, um, talk, talk to us about, because her talk is language or mother tongue, right? Uh, yeah, the constitution and linguistic di uh, diversity. So, who better than Naisha and why am I standing in the way? <laughs> National Mother Language Day. Uh, this day, which was adopted by the UN, first mentioned in 1999, and uh, formally adopted as a day to be celebrated across the world from 2008. This year's theme is the importance of mother tongue education. In a university campus which is facing sustained attack and great travails and great resistance, it is important for us to remember why, or even to understand if you don't know it, to remember why this day and why this particular month. This has to do with, um, uh, the story has to do with neighbors of ours, uh, Bangladesh, when it was East Pakistan. In March, I think 1950, uh, this uh, the the West Pakistan Parliament decided to impose Urdu upon East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. On this day, for the next two years, there was a uh, huge agitation building up. Opposition uh, kept on growing. And on this day, on the 21st of February, which is known in Bangladesh and in West Bengal as Akushe, the 21st, on Akushe, there was in Dhaka University a call for a demonstration. And just as we saw in the 
uh, days just passed, people started pouring in. And the demand was, we want to honor our mother tongue. We will speak only in our mother tongue. The vice chancellor, who was better vice chancellor than us, <laughs> rushed down, senior professors and junior professors and badly behaved professors all rushed down, tried, and there was a big clash. Police firing happened, five students were killed. And from that day began the Bangladeshi resistance. This story has been told today again by Ashish Tata in the Hindu. And he says that, why, I mean, what relevance does it have? Well, of course, we are standing in a locale where actually talking about the rights of people over the rights of na nation, national governments right, is very important. But it is also to honor our mother tongues and the marginalized. <laughs> Turning to India, around the same time, just two years before that, the Indian government and the constitution of India was adopted. And in that constitution, there was great importance given to the mother tongue. Article 30, Article 350A gave right to the instruction in the mother tongue. Protection of uh, the rights of linguistic minorities, the rights to uh, speak your mother tongue in the Indian parliament and in the Indian legislature are all mentioned in the constitution. How many mother tongues are there in India? How many of you know? <laughs> How many languages are there in India? <coughs> How many dialects are there in India? <laughs> These are questions which, you know, if you say 700, then you're very well informed because actually the Indian state does not know. It does not know how many mother tongues are spoken in this country? It doesn't. It certainly determines what languages are. And of course, dialects have no mention. India is a country that has lived in this linguistic ignorance. For what reason? First, let me tell you the facts. As we know them, because the last time the government mentioned them was in 1962 where it actually listed what were the mother tongues in our the country. And it's at 1,652. Now imagine a state which is, has to deal with the fact that this constitution, this pesky constitution of ours, has said that you, every citizen has a right to education in their mother tongue. 1,652 languages. And forget about the dialects. So from the 1971 census on, onwards, our country, our nation, if you want to call it, has been losing pluralism and the recognition of people and their rights to their culture and language at a steady rate. The census enumerator still asks the questions about language. So they go out and they ask people what you speak. Linguists have always made sure that you please don't tell them what they speak, you ask them. And the people of India in the 1991 census gave 6,000 language names. In the 2001 census, because you know, they get del mange more always, so they gave 10,441 names. And the Indian government decided that there are some mother tongues, but they are definitely languages with a capital L. And that language is with a capital L number from those, remember those 10,414 names that you Indians returned? There were 112 languages in uppercase. And when they returned 6,444 names, 40 names, then there were 114 languages. So how does the state come up with this? How does the census of India come up with these figures? It does these figures by actually doing something that all census must do, because language is often not named by itself. It is named by others. So you will get, you know, in those census answers, you will get things like, what language do you speak? I speak Mochi. What do you speak? I speak, um, you know, the name of the region that you come from. And of course it has to rationalize it, and to pair them down, and to group them. When it groups them, it uses three strategies. All three strategies are actually insulting to the people of India.
The first strategy is one that says, okay, if you have below 10,000 speakers, you're not to be counted. Now the Adivasis and the small communi smaller communities, I have students in JNU whose family, uh, his village just speaks that language. And it's 800, 1200. So this is one way to deny us the promise of our constitution, to write those languages out. They will never be taught, they will never be, they will be spoken with shame, they will have no grammars, these are people who will feel that they don't have any self-worth. They can't even learn an A, B, C, a Vandamala in a language. So, keep, so there are lots of languages below 10,000 speakers. From what I know, it's about over a thousand such languages. And they are, they are acts. Then they say, okay, so now I still have got lots of, so let's say with the figure of 10,000, I've only managed to ax about 1,000. So let me do some little more trickery. Let's make sure that uh, the languages I know which belong to a certain family, let me make smaller classifications of them. This has unfortunately led to the terrible, terrible belief that Hindi is the national language. In fact, Hindi is, there is no national language of India. There are only official languages and associate official languages, Hindi. The eighth schedule of our constitution lists just 22 languages and because it was written at the right time, there's no capital L. It just says languages, all in uppercase. There's of course a tussle to get into that eight schedule, which is, you know, some strike it lucky, some don't. So in that group, so what the census of India does is take the language names and then put together them under one language. So some dialects get put in, some, uh, you know, all fully autonomous languages get put into that bunch. Hindi from the last census, so 2001, which we have data for, is 50 distinct languages that are put into the basket of Hindi. So yeah, sure everybody speaks Hindi, but not the one that, uh, you know, Durdashan used to use, and not the one which is not a language which shows continuity across people. Not only that, the government also says that, or the strategy that is also employed, is to look at languages as um, whether they have, many of the times, it's whether languages have a written script. In a matter of a great shame for this Indian nation, not every language in India has a script. I think that, you know, there are many places where we might feel better off than the Soviet Union. But I think this is one place that, that we are not. Because in the Soviet Union, which had thousands of languages, every language was given a script by 1925. And we are here in 2015, and there is no way to write many, many languages of India. Why this tension? Why this tension, this artificial categories of languages with an uppercase L is a betrayal of our constitution. And of course, as you know, the world moves further into this, actually hurt, hurtles headlong into this path of you know, criminalized development, and more and more people have to go and leave their homes, leave their lands, lose their languages. There is a lot of concern that people have about what, is, what happens when a language is endangered. And we are given all kinds of utilitarian understandings that, oh, no, no, we must preserve languages. We must make sure, because these are the people who have the knowledge of their culture. They know the lay of the land. They know the flora and the flora. Well, this is good if this knowledge rests with the community. We've seen in many cultures, and increasingly so we shall see, that just thinking of a utilitarian need to say that, oh, they're really important for quote-unquote indigenous knowledge systems is not enough because the knowledge does not stay with that community. Rather, I think that as linguists, and you know, we all write good letters, Noam wrote a good one today. Uh, I think we, as linguists, as people, and citizens of this country, we should think of what does it mean to have a language in terms of the area of knowledge. Linguists, the kind of linguistics I do, and many students in our center do, there is a way, I mean, of course there's a linguistics which focuses on the politics of language, the discursive properties of language, and how meanings are created, because in the end, ultimately all that survives is that written or oral record. But there is another way that you can do linguistics, and that's the kind we do. 
which is to think that every language that exists in each individual instantiates a specific type of human language. A, a knowledge that actually has got nothing to do with nationalities, nothing to do with nations, nothing to do with groupings, nothing to do with caste. It's a specific domain specific knowledge which enables the human mind to express itself. So in that, so the loss of any one language is the loss of knowledge which a person has. And if we are, if we stand here today in a university, to what are we talking about? Of course, we have a current crisis. We'll win it, no problem. But <laughs> we might have one such crisis. But what do we want to leave behind? We want to leave behind an academics and a legacy which says every language is equal. Every language, whether you know the government gives it a grammar or not, or whether it has a script, not every language tells us something about what it is to be human. So every human has human dignity. And it is the upholding the greatest humanist traditions that the work of Noam Chomsky and many thousands of linguists around is interested in. So in this framework, the loss of any language is a loss of a way for me to know. So I don't go as ethnographic conqueror. I go as a student. I go to learn what they know. So it's a tradition of humility and of dignity. I will, I guess I've done, done too much, so I'll just speak a little bit more. When in this great university that we have, just like this great nation with a capital N, university with a cap, small letter U. <laughs> in this great university, every year, students come into our classroom, into the linguistics department classroom, speaking Hindi, English, Punjabi sometimes, um, maybe they speak some bit Malayalam. They all speak languages with capital letters in the first time. By the time we are done with them, they are speaking Bajjika, Angika, Maghi, Tamang, uh, Tagin. This, we, as if we are to be citizens, and I would request everybody give a slogan in their own language as I finish. If we are to be citizens, and especially on this day, but every day, we must speak our languages and we must speak them with pride. Thank you. The census on Sanskrit. Oh, I'm being told by popular demand to tell you how. I mean, we should really not think of the census as actually telling us anything about who we are. Um, you know, the definition of mother tongue uh, in the Indian census is one that um, says that it's a very, I mean, it's a really deep definition. So it says, what's your mother tongue? Language spoken to you by your mother. <laughs> no, it's a government. It's a government definition. There's an and, or, or that if so and what. Right? So, or a language spoken in the household if you're a deaf mute. Okay. This is the definition in the, that's the first and last time, I think again in six days, they defined it. Now, very interestingly, one has to be really worried about the health of many communities. So if the census is every 10 years, and so, I mean, what is the reproductive possibilities that you can have? Remember, it's a language spoken by your mother, huh? or the people around you if you're a deaf mute. Between 1971 and 1981, Reporting for Sanskrit grew by 6,000%. I think we have to feel really sorry for the women. Oh, okay. And I would like now, so today we've had a really very good day, um, watching a series of films on cultures that we should learn lessons from. By the way, no self-respecting person from the Northeast comes back and says, I speak Manipuri. They all come and say the names of the languages they actually speak. So you will find many, many languages and much, much more variety. Today we've had the pleasure of watching six uh, films by Tarun Bhartya, who's also kindly agreed to speak to us. These are films about uh, the so-called language and culture 
of the Northeast. And what we've come away with is this incredibly plural, beautiful living culture, which does not get fixed, which escapes museums, which is of the people tied up with practice and constantly changing. Tarun has agreed to speak to us also, and I don't know where he is. <laughs> Oh, questions that I can take, but maybe Tarun can speak or what? Oh, I can take questions. Anybody wants to ask questions? No, I'll let them. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you're absolutely right that the manifestation of this neoliberal exploitative system, which actually can also, by the way, encourage language, language learning. So if you look at the 15th and 16th century, conquistadores were the first people to write grammars. Then there were people who, you know, people who actually penetrated into um, lands and told them they, they used the language, they, they wrote grammars of the language, they learned the language. In fact, multilingualism kept and decimated to do, killed the people but kept a record. That tradition continues. What's the point that's being made over there? That if your world is one which involves marketing, in much your world where you have to, it, but you don't really want to, you know, invest in dug in. It's better that you people learn English, Hindi. So regional languages from a process from the 1960s, that what has solidified is less and less diversity. And that diversity is now being deployed, linguist is being deployed to be able to create um, well, certainly dividends for people. The most tragic thing, I think, is that when people do not speak the language of their oppressors, they are effectively, usually this is, when they're silenced. But the struggle of the Dongria Kont in Niamgari, where even the activists who went there actually didn't speak with, but this was a small area, and because they could speak in their own languages, the great resistance of the happened. So both for, you know, I mean, linguistic pluralism is our weapon. It is, it is our strength. It is not, because if we speak one, two, five languages, we'll be picked up and hit. Any kind of What is your opinion about People's Linguistic Survey? Okay, so the People's Linguistic Survey is certainly people's, but it's not linguistic. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to be so blunt. I mean, it's a very good initiative. People are involved. But I do believe that, you know, certainly having a participant research methodology where something should belong to the people who created it. Identity has a place. But encouraging processes where Identities are formed only around language is also another way of you know leveling differences. So just because we all speak a particular language, I don't want to be trapped in that identity without my right to say my politics, my opinions, my views. <laughs> Linguistic identity in highly multilingual countries is never unitary. So you know, in monolingual countries like um, Europe and actually not so much the United States, where really the idea that you can speak just one language is so ingrained that you cannot imagine. We did a linguistic survey of JNU uh, three years ago, and I'm proud to tell you that every person in the average number of languages anybody speaks is four. Now, if that's the situation, then to tie my identity to just one language is to deny the fact that I have in in each of us, there is one language that connects us to the other. I'm afraid that in my view, the, in all our efforts, whether the People's Linguistic Survey or otherwise, the fact that we do not foreground our multilinguality 
where plurality is not either, you know, keep some Dongria Kondi or come see, keep some Hindi speakers here, keep some Kashmiris there. The fact that we all speak one language that is able to connect us to the other. That is the base, that our understanding of plurality is one that is based on solidarity. That gets elided when we only have linguistic identities. Right. I mean, so this is again a mistake that the Indian state has been made by uh, not looking at what is what are the patterns of multilingualism. How do I, you know, speakers decide which language they are going to use in which domain. So all of us who hear, there must be at least some quote-unquote classical language that you've heard somebody mumble which you didn't understand in some, you know, festival or the other. Right, and you don't, don't speak it, but you reckon you give it a speciality value. That's an important part of your identity. Right? Similarly, the languages that you choose to have functional relations. So, you know, if you've got a pain in your uh, stomach, you know, nine times out of ten, you'll say it in your first language. It might be English, of course. But, you know, maybe Pete my dirt hair sounds just more agonized than, you know, my back is hurting. So, <laughs> so it could be. I mean, so you, English could be one of your languages, your first languages as well. Now, if we look at the, first of all, communities have to be involved. So, what is the language that is highly prized? Why do we make the choice between languages of education, the one that says, get rid of your other language? It's quite possible. Everybody should have a right to learn English, it's just a language. Everybody, if they're dying to speak Sanskrit to be able to figure out all how science and technology all happened in the Vedas, <laughs> please go ahead. They're just languages. We will learn them, we will speak them. But don't ask me to stop speaking Tagin at home. That is why this country has, you know, these zones of linguistic diversity have existed. Because we have not done this functional, you know, really surgical amputation. Languages live in ecologies along with people. And if the Indian government was interested, you know, if it wasn't so scared of the mother tongue, it could just say, okay, so what other languages do you speak? Do you speak Chhattisgarhi? Right? Do you speak Hindi? Do you speak Sadri? Well, like, why can't you have, you know, large regions of India are connected by linked languages? Why couldn't they use them? But in fact, those languages are not really even counted because they are not a capital L. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that you know, आपने कहा है बिल्कुल सही कहा है कि you know कौन सी languages हम pick करेंगे एक चीज होती है language of instruction वहाँ क्योंकि हमारे यहाँ इतना हुजूम आता है अलग अलग प्रांतों से अलग अलग भाषाएं बोलने वाले तो शायद उस लैंग्वेज को जैसे मैं लिंग्विस्टिक्स को मैं पढ़ा ही नहीं सकती हमारे लोग से सीरिया से है केरला से है मैं अंग्रेजी के सवाल कुछ पढ़ा नहीं सकती अंग्रेजी भाषा में पर आप जो कह रहे हैं कि एंट्रेंस एग्जाम चाहे आप देख लीजिए कोई एक कि अगर एक तो मुझे मालूम नहीं आप फारसी पढ़ने आ रहे हैं तो आपकी इंग्लिश क्यों टेस्ट हो रही है बिल्कुल नहीं सब लोग हमारे यहाँ लिंग्विस्टिक्स पढ़ने आते हैं हम उनकी इंग्लिश नहीं टेस्ट करते हम उनकी लिंग्विस्ट नॉलेज अनालिसिव लैंग्वेज पर ये तो हो ही सकता है कि अगर सर्टनली अगर 50 मार्क तो प्रॉब्लम इस कि जब तक आप एक इसको इंस्टीट्यूशनलाइज नहीं करेंगे अगर आपके पास ट्रांसलेशन ब्यूरो नहीं आपको करेक्टर्स नहीं होंगे जो उस ज़बान को पढ़ सकें क्योंकि जेएनयू का एग्जाम ज़्यादातर तो ऑब्जेक्टिव तो होता नहीं है अब हो गया तो बहुत दुखी बात है तो इसलिए आई एग्री विद यू बट व्हाट इज़ द कंक्रीट प्रपोजल पहले दो तीन लैंग्वेज क्यों हमारे यहाँ कोई बंगला 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 में लिखता है तो हम लोग इमीडिएटली कोई बंगाली स्टूडेंट टीचर को दे देते हैं जरूर 
आई मीन आई थिंक ये यू नो सिर्फ डिमांड करना देखिए जे की जो परंपरा है सिर्फ डिमांड करना नहीं है जे एन यू की परंपरा यह है कि आप ही सोल्यूशन भी दीजिए अपने एक्सपीरियंस से मैं आपसे नहीं आप स्टूडेंट्स यूनियन आपकी है लेट एस स्पीक ऑफ सोल्यूशन Right? If it, maybe it is objective type, but this is something that has to be done with the teachers, not against the teachers. Uh, I want to suggest to what he is saying uh, that uh, I think. जो आपने बात बोली ना कि अलग-अलग भाषाएं इतनी सारी हैं और अपनी-अपनी उनकी solidarities एक साथ हो सकती हैं. तो वो उसमें भी हो सकता है कि वो कैबलरीज एक दूसरे की सैंपल करते रहें दोस्त दोस्ताना तरीके से. तो वो भी बड़ा अच्छी बात रहेगी. बिल्कुल. बिल्कुल uh, एक आप आपके जो बगल में बैठे हैं उनसे एक सेंटेंस उनकी भाषा में तो सीख लीजिए आज ही सीख लीजिए कल इस्तेमाल करिएगा देखें वर्ड्स ट्रेवल द काइंड ऑफ लिंग्विस्टिक्स वी डू उसमें जेटिव लिंग्विस्टिक्स में यू नो कश्मीरी कैन लुक लाइक ये डिश एंड संथाली हैज द सेम प्रॉपर्टीज एज फ्रेंच सो दस यू ऑलरेडी आर ऑल लिंग्विस्ट यू स्पीक अमन लैंग्वेज It's just that you make that step of solidarity. I says, I want to know what you say. I want to learn what it is. We've lived in a culture where we all learn languages, you know, certainly middle class cultures, where we learn languages for use. But we also come from cultures where we speak languages for solidarity, for neighbourliness. And I think we should, you know, uphold both. I'm not saying give one up for the other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which is I would like to ask a question that yeah. why the state forces a language on its people? First of all, why there should be a official language or national language? And I am such an example of Israel that gave it to us to write the whole war, the whole war section in the area of Palestine and then the state of Israel was declared. But now the Hebrew language has been forced on them or they have happily accepted. My question is why the state forces a language on its people? A unique language, right? I mean, I really, since I'm not really, as you know, I'm standing in JNU, we're not very good at being with the state, clearly, as you believe all the... I can't say. But that's a certain version of nationalism which comes to us, a nation that comes to us from the 19th century. One language, one people, and we are marching with pointed feet onwards to the progress. Right? That's not progress. And that's not the reality. They can't beat your languages out of you. But so therefore, it is to consolidate a certain vision of state power, to be able to instrumentalize the citizen you know in that exercise of say state power these are realities the best way you can resist is by learning another language right and speaking it freely but you know why states do it why are you asking me <laughs> but maybe you can give the next talk <laughs> thank you very much ma'am for uh, answering so many questions